Hey guys, it's Roderick and I'm here with a review of Netflix, The Inside Man, um, starring David Tennant and Stanley Tucci. So I know y'all are like, Bish, how are you in here reviewing another, a Netflix show and you haven't even finished um, you? Okay, there is a very logical and real reason why I'm not giving you a you review. When I do my you review tonight or this week, um, I hopefully I'll try to get out before Housewives. I will explain to you why there has not been, why it took me so long for me to review you, and it will all make sense in the end. I promise. But no, I will finish you, so I can I can totally understand why you like totally side eyeing these videos that are coming out that I haven't even finished you yet. Okay, so let's get started. What we're gonna do, um, typically for like I do for these net Netflix review. If you're new to this channel, welcome. Uh, this is where we talk about television shows and movies with the eye towards screenwriting and acting and directing and a lot of, and a little bit of kiki as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you kind of like an overview, what I liked about the show, what I didn't like about the show, some of my kind of overbroad 40,000 feet above kind of comments. Then if you haven't watched the show yet, you can stop. And then if you have watched the show, you can keep on watching and we can get into some of the nitty gritty plot points and details and have a a little kiki, okay? So the Inside Mail it was created and written by Stephen Moffat, who is the creator and writer for the Sherlock series. So that was my hook immediately, right? Because I love the Sherlock series. If you have not watched it, I think it still is on Netflix. I think it might be on Prime with the BBC, uh, starring uh, Benedict Cumberbatch and Martin Freeman. So it's a Sherlock Holmes modern day type of twist. It is excellent. It's literally like three episodes a season. I think there's about three seasons. I think probably three seasons. I don't think they did four. So it's a really, really great show. If you like the murder mystery, cerebral, thriller type of shows that really follow. If you've ever read the Sherlock Holmes books like I have, they really redo and put a modern twist on some of the modern day Sherlock Holmes stuff. So watch that after you finish um, The Inside Man, right? So coming into this, I have pretty much had zero to negative expectations, which is kind of what I like going into new shows or new uh, films where I kind of don't know really that much about it. I can kind of look at it. I see the trailer, decide, okay, I'm going to watch it, right? But Stephen Moffat had earned my trust because he did such a great job with Sherlock. I was like, okay, I'll give this whirl. Stanley Tucci, Stanley Tucci, who I really, who, have all, who I really like. And David Tennant, who I'm kind of like, eh, okay. I think my, my in my mouth with David Tennant came from the Jessica Jones series. Um, I, I, I didn't really like his character as a purple man. That's nothing bad to say about him. I just, I don't know. After the, his whole Jessica Jones situation, I was like, mwah, mwah, mwah. but I was like, let's roll the dice and see what we got, right? So the premise of the show is, is that, um, a woman Janice finds herself in a very unfamiliar and precarious situation with the vicar of a town in, um, England, and then we have Stanley Tucci's character, who's, who is Jeffrey Grief, who is winning his life sentence and forms a relationship with a crime writer from England named Beth, right? So that's kind of like our setup or whatever. What I really liked about The Inside Man is that the inciting incident that kind of kicks everything off, because remember we're doing, because it's a limited series and it's only four episodes, right? So our inciting incident that kind of happens during our first act really kind of like hooked me, right? I was like, okay, where is this going? You've really kind of established some of these characters, a lot of the characters kind of like who they are. And I was really invested in their journey along the way. I thought that was really, really good. Um, Jeffrey Grief kind of plays our Sherlock holmes s type of character. Um, and, and which is very interesting considering his obvious limitations, right? Considering he's on death row. Um, and he, and I, I liked, because you know, most detective shows kind of have like a sidekick person. I was kind of side-eyeing his um, choice for Mr. Grease, Mr. Grease sidekick, but it is very interesting. And one of the things I, I thought found to be very interesting is Stephen Moffat is obviously British. He writes British characters. So when you think about... You know, a writer writes what they know, not necessarily experientially or just kind of conceptually. It was very interesting to see like who he chose to be um, Grief's sidekick. Um, and because of where Grief is, 
on death row, kind of that whole like I don't know why people think that when people are on death row, you got to do the banjoy, sad, soulful, bluesy music. Like I don't know where that came from. Like I'm sure the people who came up with that music weren't on death row, but for some reason that's what they like to do since Green Mile. So it's very interesting to see that this is what Moffat thinks American prison complex is is this very southerny banjoy like kind of music to kind of give us the tone of being on death row. I ain't been on death row, I don't know, but I could probably think of a other better music or whatever to set to that. Once again, not my show, not my choice, not that very interesting thing. So we get our inciting incident, and what I really also like is they really kind of establish kind of why we would be invested in some of the main characters, from David Tennant's character as the vicar to Janice as the move as, as the math tutor, and Beth Davenport, who kind of wasn't, who kind of gave me Meghan Markle tease for a little bit, but not that much. I think kind of like in her composition, not in her actions, right? So as the show goes through, all goes through on the first two episodes, I thought were really, really good, right? So they kind of establish our stakes. We got our inciting incident, and we're like kind of off to the races, kind of like, okay, what's going to happen now? Then the show kind of like took a turn somewhere like halfway, like towards the end of the second episode to the fourth episode, where I started to be like, hmm. And I think the and I think what I've noticed. Um, is that the show starts to talk, starts to introduce or talk about certain themes that I just kind of like had to kind of side eye a little bit, right? And one of the themes they're talking about in the show is best relationship with Stanley Tucci, right? And as I was thinking about the show today before I did this interview, I realized that Stanley Tucci is on death row for committing a heinous act, right? You'll find out what it is when you watch the show. But one of the things I have to kind of start side-eyeing in 2023 are these fictional narratives that sympathize or make heinous murderers seem to be very sympathetic and endearing, right? I recognize it's fiction, it's not a doc documentary, but that type of psyche pathology does get embedded in a collective narrative, right? So the fact is, is that once you, you know, is that would, can he or could he have created a character that was not a white man that did a such bunch of heinous acts that made him very sympathetic, right? So because one of the things we see in today's media is really the criminalization of black victims and the very sympathizing effect of white male perpetrator murderers, right? So I, it, and not to say that that kind of affected what I thought of the show, but overall, I just kind of be like, okay, here we go. There's another brilliant murderer, or, you know, horrible person. So overall, I would say give, give the Inside Man a watch, right? It's four episodes. You could do it on a weekend, you know, start it at eight and you could really be done by midnight and then go to brunch the next day over the weekend. I found it to be very enjoyable. The characters were really, really, really interesting. Even the sub characters, I found the ending to be, you know, it's very like Netflixy, where like they give you a limited series to kind of see what the numbers are going to be. And so it does give you kind of a cliffhanger to see whether or not um, there's going to be another season or another limited season. I thought that the storylines, you know, there were about two or three of them. They all really tied in and tracked perfectly. So I really didn't have a whole lot of critique structurally as with the show. I thought it was very well written. I thought the characters were very corporeal. They had stakes. They had arcs. They had investments. They had objectives. So it was a really good show. It's just that once again, in those kind of middle episodes, things got to get a little mucky. And I was just kind of like, hmm. Okay, but it really didn't detract from the overall enjoyment of this series. I would definitely highly recommend this series. I thought it was really, really good. Very well written. Stanley Tucci, once again, can't do that much wrong in my eyes. David Tennant, you know, very much redeemed himself. And I thought it was a very great, you know, limited investment, limited edition series. So that's my thoughts. Go watch The Inside Man. Now, if you've already watched it, Hold on, we're about to get into some details. If you haven't, save the video and the watch later. Don't forget to watch, don't forget to like and subscribe. Come back and see what I kind of thought about some of the details and plot points, okay? Now you've been warned. Okay, let's get into this. So the moral of this limited series is mind your damn business, right? Because Janice would not have been in the situation she would have been in if she had just minded her damn business. 
which is why I kept watching the show, right? Because if you go to the first scene when Janice is on the bus with Beth and she kind of wards off the guy who's like sexually harassing her, what Moffat does very excellently is he establishes the fact that Janice is the type of person who will stick her nose on other people's business and therefore has an investment in the outcome, right? So therefore, that is why the vicar could not let Janice go and when it was believable because Janice would run and go tell, right? So that's why I kept watching because I thought that was very well done because typically you would be like, well, why does he really care about Janice? Is Janice going to say something? No, we've already seen, he's already shown us that Janice is the type of person who would go and tell, who would feel this moral conviction and not necessarily a moral conviction. And we just found out is the fact that she thinks he, she is so much more smarter than everybody else. And therefore the kind of like moral high roading type of thing that she would do to the, you know, based upon the situation. So I really like that. That is the hook. And that was the hook that got me into it. Um, the whole, but now then we get into some kind of like nuancey problems that I, towards, like I said, in the second or third episode, that kind of made me sigh out this, this whole kind of journey, right? So, okay, we get it. So the first, our first storyline, obviously, right, is Janice and the vicar, right? Our next storyline, our next, our next storyline is the vicar and Edgar. Beneath that is Mr. Grief and Beth, and then ultimately Beth trying to find Janice, right? So we got about four of them all together that are going on, right? So when we meet Mr. Grief and he's like talking to the senator and he's like this smart person, it kind of does make me think that like at the end when the guy goes, you just guessed, right? He, you know, it wasn't that he utilized any Sherlock Holmesian detective deductions from being in death row. He pretty much used deduction and inferences to come to a natural conclusion with the help of other people on the outside to confirm what he knew or did not know, right? And I, you know, I, I again, I thought Stanley Tucci did a great job. I like the concept of this death row inmate who's like going around solving problems, doing whatever, the whole thing about the $235.33 from the senator's wife and all this stuff. I thought that was nice. I I think I just, this whole kind of like, you know, Aaron Sorkin, when I was, when he had that show, The Newsroom or The Newspaper, but the television show, I forget what the name was on HBO, but he had a tendency to have these white men giving these long white man -y kind of like soliloquy monologues. And Moffat kind of does that at certain points, right? And I and that just kind of like at my age and stage and where we are in life, I'm just kind of tired of white men just kind of explaining shit that's pretty much basic or that they act like they just kind of got from the Holy Ghost, right? So that being said, I still like the grief character. I thought Beth was a very interesting person because her investment in Janice seems to, be, you know, was revealed to be very superficial, right? She met her on the bus. She stopped her from being assaulted. She kept trying to text her to have lunch. Janice could pretty much take or leave Beth, right? But it is Beth's investment in this relationship that ultimately ends up, you know, trying to save Janice's life. And the fact is that Janice, you know, when she was sitting in the house and he was like, the fact is she ain't really your friend because you're sitting in her house and you don't know you're in her house. I was like, Okay, that makes sense. Let's talk about the vicar's wife, right? Because she was a very interesting character because I was, you know, she, she, I was worried that she was going to end up playing like that typical kind of Lady Macbethian type of character where she's like, killer, killer, killer. And I felt like that was kind of where the wife was headed, but she kind of has some nuance to her, right? And the fact that both the vicar and the wife were really trying to find a way out of this. Mind you, the solution was, <clears throat> and this is kind of where we have to suspend our disbelief and go with it, right? So let's play the course of events back. Edgar gives the vicar the, the flash drive, right? Janice in her nosy ass picks up the flash drive. Janice sees what's on the flash drive. The, all the vicar had to do was pick up his phone and say, hey, Edgar, did you give me a flash drive on bop, 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 boop day? Edgar would be like, yes or no. 
Then he'd be like, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, Edgar, if not, I'm going to tell your mama and give your mama the flash drive. And there we go. So we could see, so there was enough circumstantial evidence that the vicar could have used to convince Janet or at least plant enough seeds of doubt that the stat, the flash drive was not really um, the vicar's son, right? But that we just see the vicar stumbling and being so uncommunicative. And I recognize the, the, the uh, priest parishioner level of confidentiality. But what doesn't make sense is, is that if you're willing to lock a woman in your basement and ultimately try to kill her to protect your son, you could have told the truth about Edgar and that would have protected your son, right? But I think he wanted to see the whole senses of, of, of what Stanley of what Stanley Tucci's character tries to tell you is, is that on any given day, any person could be a murderer based upon the wrong circumstances. I don't necessarily agree with that, but I understand the theory um, and I think in application to this show, it does work. I don't think it necessarily works in real life. And I think that's a very dangerous concept to put out there to kind of justify people not having any type of self-control or using their brains and just moving off of emotions, right? But whatever, right? So the wife I thought was a very interesting character because she, she it wasn't like she was this criminal mastermind that was heartless and it wasn't like she was... Um, you know, just a heartless bitch or whatever. She just she was just in a tough spot, and she understood why the vicar did what she did. I thought her getting hit by the truck at the end was like, okay, I didn't see that coming. But I think it reckons, right? Like, you, you have to pay a karmic debt for doing all this bad shit, vicar. So you think that you're going to leave out of here and be okay with your wife? Nah, there's going to be blood in the streets, literally, right? So let's talk about Mr. Grief for a second, right? So I really like the Mr. Grief character. I thought that that was like really done. I kind of side eye his big black, you know, cheerful little sidekick kind of thing, uh, which once again, you know, informs me of what Moffat thinks about American prison systems, the American complex or whatever like that. And I mean, again, I think the casting is great. I think, I, again, I always applaud when I see people of color, black people in roles, whatever. But I mean, I just was like, really? You gotta have a big black serial killer who's like kind of slightly a genius and he does, you know, whatever. Anyway, whatever. Again, it's de minimis. It was not that problem. What I did side eye was does the what I when I mentioned the storylines, the one I did not mention, the one I cared less about, was where he buried his wife's head. Because they the show did nothing to make us any investment in the murder that Mr. Grief committed. Why do why would we really care? about where the wife's head was murdered. Now, what they do, what Moffat does, is he uses the whole wife's head and where he's where the um, head is buried to reveal truly that Mr. Grief really does not want to die. All throughout his interactions with Beth and some of the other characters, we get the sense that he's this like strong, steely man who's, the, you know, who's consigned to his fate. He's on death row. This is where I am. But when the moment comes and the warden tells him he's about to die in three weeks, we see that that steely undergirding of Mr. Grief really begins to shake and shatter. And he comes up with a way to kind of figure out how he can stop from being executed, which I thought it was great because it kind of gives our antagonist, you know, a, you know, a more sympathetic human side. He actually is scared of dying. He really does want to live, even though he realizes he really does not deserve to live. And the whole interaction between grief and his dead wife's father, I thought was great, even though I'm not a big fan of alluding to something. I, you know, there's a difference between illusion and inference. And the thing is, is that, one person alludes, another person infers, right? So they alluded that he was some criminal mastermind or whatever in England, but somehow he's like this big boss in America who's like flying in helicopters and doing all this stuff. And I was like, okay, fine, you know? So we don't really think, we still don't know like why Mr. Grief committed the murder, why, um, you know, why this happened, why he decapitated or whatever. And I really don't care, right? I'd rather see the little mysteries he kind of follow, he kind of solves along the way. And if we find that out, we find that out. It's kind of like Rick and Morty with this, with like Rick's backstory about his wife. I really didn't care about that. I really cared about like the adventures Rick and Morty went on, right? So it's the same thing because like all the little mysteries he was solving for Beth, like along the way, 
I found those to be interesting. Like the woman who killed her husband and was whole ass sitting up in the prison pretending like she didn't just because she wanted her daughter to know. But we don't want really to figure out why it is. All he says is, is a, you know, one way for you to die is to be a husband or is to be a spouse to come home early. So I feel like, again, he got a lot of cute with that, right? Because we don't understand the subtext because we don't understand the context, right? So I recognize that that was intended to be some sort of subtext, but the context was murky because we just... We just told him he killed him. We don't know why. You know, he never kind of went to that. So I feel like sometimes he got a little bit too cute for his own good. But again, it was such on a de minimis scale that I really didn't like. I really did like the inside man, right? And I kind of liked the little characters Beth would meet kind of along the way. And the revelation that they really didn't stick to landing that maybe this half of this problem is about Beth, you know, overestimating her importance in someone else's life, right? Because I, you really couldn't get the motivation as to why Beth was so frantic with this relationship with Janice, right? Janice showed no interest in being friends with her. She really didn't want to be friends with her. And she was like, bye, whatever. But we really don't get the sense of anything about Beth that would kind of tell us, like, why Beth was so set on having this relationship with Janice. So I thought that was really good. Now, Janice should have minded her own business. I ain't got that much to say about Janice because if you've been watching this channel, you kind of know that this, that 2023, the rest of the year, is hashtag MYOB, mind your own business. Because if Janice had just minded her business and been like, you know what, Vicar, that's between you, Jesus, and your son, and whatever the Holy Ghost has going on in here and went on home, it would have been a wrap. Show would have been over, right? So... What was good is, is that because they established that, Janice wouldn't have got there. Now, Janice trying to play mind games and Cannibal Lecter with the husband and the wife, that was cute, but I was like, girl, you you found the right couple, right? Because most people, if they were really about, about trying to protect their son, you'd have been six feet under a long fucking time ago, right? So, you know, and, and some of you could tell that I got, there were certain details that I really did enjoy that showed that the vicar and the wife weren't really hard criminals. Like, Googling carbon monoxide. Clearly, the police check your Google history. That's a dead giveaway. Logging to Janice's email account from your own IP address. So all these things that they're doing that any criminal mastermind who's ever watched the first 48 or at least a, ep a couple of episodes of Law and Order would know that's what told these, these are some things that would get you straight caught up along, along the way. So I like that he included those details to show that these people aren't really criminal masterminds and that they're moving out of a place of emotion and not kind of like hardcore sociopathy or something like that. So anyway, I'm really excited to know what you all thought of the Inside Man. Again, I'm giving it four and a three quarter stars. I really enjoyed it. I want to hear what you all, you guys thought. Drop down in the comments. Let me know. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and share. And I'll see you guys later. Bye.